Recently, a certain IQ denialist account on Twitter.com alleged that realists have never provided a coherent explanation for why slash how different environments supposedly selected for high or low intelligence alleles during evolutionary history. High intelligence would be advantageous in all environments. This is incorrect. We have cold winters theory. But he says that a weak theory is Richard Lynn's cold winters hypothesis, where the idea is that archaic Europeans experienced cold winters and this somehow selected for high intelligence because they needed to plan ahead for the winter. This person says that this is completely dumb. It assumes archaic Africans didn't also need to plan ahead for seasonal droughts and changes in food supply or hunting expeditions or war. He alleges that cold winters theory assumes that surviving in Africa is a cakewalk. This is incorrect. There is actually good evidence for cold winters theory and that's what I want to cover in this video. The fact is that cold winters theory alleges that surviving in cold winters is harder than surviving in warmer winters. That doesn't mean surviving in warm climates is a cakewalk, especially when you have no technology, but it does mean that surviving in colder winters is more difficult and that there is more benefit to evolving more intelligence in colder climates. The reality is that there are four main lines of evidence for this theory which do not rely on molecular genetic data, then there is a fifth line of evidence which does rely on molecular genetics. The four non-molecular genetic lines of evidence are 1. Intelligence is higher among people who evolved further from the equator. 2. Archaeological evidence shows that hunter-gatherers further from the equator developed more tools. 3. Humans further from the equator have larger brains, a trait which is known to be causally responsible for higher intelligence. 4. Within species, animals further from the equator have larger brains. Emil Kierkegaard wrote a blog post summarizing these four lines of evidence. The data on the correlation between IQ and the winter high temperature is very simple and very clear. It shows a correlation between IQ and the high winter temperature of negative 0.76. This has been replicated using different temperature and IQ data sets. So what this means is that the nicest temperature that you get in the winter is a great predictor of your national IQ. It's predicting about 60% of the variance in national IQ, so it's certainly not the only factor, but it is in fact a huge factor. It's much more significant than summer temperatures, and it's about as large as the, the correlation with latitude, where obviously latitude is not causal. So there's something going on with sunlight and cold temperatures, which makes the environment more harsh. There's less food in such environments. Winter is actually longer. You, you have to plan for longer. I know this because I have lived in Florida, and I have lived in the northern U.S., and guess what? Spring starts in Florida in like February. If there is a winter in Florida, it's like two months. You don't have to plan that much, and it's not harsh. You go north, and you have a really harsh winter for eight months. So the second line of evidence is that hunter-gatherers further from the equator produced more technology and more complicated technology. So they had a greater number of types of tools, and the tools that they had were more developed, kind of like having an, a diamond pickaxe in Minecraft instead of a stone pickaxe, and then also having not only a pickaxe, but also an axe, a hoe, stuff like that. So these figures show the relation between amount and complexity of tools and latitude, and it shows that as latitude increases, so distance from the equator increases, both those metrics increase. Um, this is not true in food producers for some reason. This might be an exousiology moment. Food producers are essentially the masses. These are sort of domesticated people that exist to just make food for elites. So that might be why they're not undergoing selection for intelligence. But when life is harder, everyone is an elite. In colder climates, you see that more complicated behavior is going on. So this is very strong evidence for cold winters theory. It's very hard to dodge this. Next are point three and four, that humans and other species further from the equator have larger brains. So we have data on this, and what this shows, so larger brains are causally associated with more intelligence at about r equals point three in humans. So when you get further from the equator and your brain increases across species as well, this shows that something with the environment getting more harsh is increasing the size of your brain, and this should have an impact on intelligence. So again, this is very, very hard for denialists to get away from. I'm not really sure how you argue against this. So finally, we will get into the molecular genetic evidence. 
So this part is adapted from a Substack post by George Francis. It's in the description. I definitely recommend that you check it out. The central idea is that the climate has changed in a, in a cycle over the last few millennia. There have been many ice ages. There was a medieval warm period, for instance. So the idea is that the concentration of IQ genes should be going up at a greater rate when the globe is cooling than when it's getting warmer because more humans are adapting to a colder environment when the climate overall is cooling. In addition to that, there was an out of Africa event, which means a lot of early humans were leaving Africa to go to colder climates. So we should also expect selection for intelligence genes to correlate with that. And in fact, what George Francis found is that there is a strong association with selection for intelligence associated single nucleotide polymorphisms in the out of Africa event, which happened about 60,000 years ago. There was not any detectable association between uh, the climate cycle and cooling and selection for intelligence genetics. So overall, the molecular genetics data adds some evidence for the cold winters theory. Now, when you zoom out and look at the full picture, just the correlation between latitude and national IQ alone suggests that cold winters theory definitely has something to it, but it's not going to explain all of IQ selection, certainly. Still, without cold winters theory, how do you explain populations in colder climates, which are more harsh and should have less resources, being more intelligent? How do you explain that? So I think some confusion arises in some opponents of cold winters theory in that they think that the theory is supposed to 100% deductively explain all of the IQ variation between populations. This is not true. As you can see, when it comes to predicting national IQ based on cold winter temperature, winter highs only explain about 60% of the variance. So that's another 40% that we still need to explain. And in fact, there are some outlier populations like the Chinese. The Chinese have a higher IQ than you would expect by their climate. They live in a little bit of a warmer climate. It would seem that biome might also be a factor. The relationship might also not be completely linear. Inuits and other Arctic populations tend to have lower IQs than cold winters theory would predict. They should be much smarter, obviously, because they have much harsher winters, but it seems like their intelligence is not as selective for as in more temperate climates with forests. So it's very possible that there's a locally linear relationship that breaks down in linearity when it gets to very extreme temperatures. It might have something to do with national IQ being related to the marginal benefit of a gain in IQ relative to the costs of that gain. An environment can be very harsh, it can be very cold, but if there's not a lot of room for innovation, like in the Arctic, if it's basically just living in an igloo and there's not much else to do, just live in an igloo and eat seals and eat fish, and there's no room for innovation in that environment, it's just very harsh and there's one way to do it and you can barely live with a small population there, you're not going to get intelligence selected for as much. Uh, as in an environment that's maybe less harsh, but there's a lot of potential for life hacks and stuff like that, for figuring new things out and innovating and creating civilizations. Another thing that anti-cold winters theory opponents tend to point out is that a lot of early civilizations were in very warm climates, but Emil Kierkegaard points out that you can't just measure a civilization's IQ by their civilization. There might need to be a base IQ, for civilization to start, but you also need certain materials, so it's possible that cold winters select for IQ more than the weather in the Arabian Peninsula does, but that there, it's the environment is just so much harsher where the northern Scythians and stuff were living on the European steppe that Arabians are still going to outperform them in civilization because of environmental factors. It's also possible that populations went to the north and got their intelligence selected for positively and evolved higher intelligence and then came back to the south and did, successful, did successfully with their higher intelligence. That is a, a theory with the ancient Greeks. They were said to be the descendants of more northern populations. They came and settled in Greece and then had this more abundant environment where intelligence wouldn't have been selected for as much, but they used the intelligence that they derived from the warmer climates. You kind of see this with America. It's like white people go to Florida and then have a first world country there. Uh, other you know, warm places will be very backwards and look like Haiti. 
There's also the possibility of genetic admixture, so these populations are not totally isolated. The warmer populations without as much intelligence selection pressures might actually just receive more intelligence genes from northern, northern populations that they're getting a little bit of admixture from, and then even though those genes weren't being selected for in their environment, they're getting exposed to them, and then that can help start civilization because these more southern populations are more equal, not southern necessarily, but uh, southern and the northern hemisphere, these more equator-bound populations, can then end up with an increase in intelligence from admixture with northern populations, but then they also have the nice environment, so they start like Sumerian civilization. That could also explain why there was never any civilization in Africa. It arose in nice warm places, but it was warm places with Caucasoids close to Europe, you know, that could that were at that were mixing with European populations, right? That's the most uh, admix. When when the when some of the denialists say that there are no discrete races, uh, that's not true between Europeans and Africans. If you look on a cluster chart and you just have Africans and Europeans and you have no like Arabians in between, it's two discrete clusters. If you try to compare Syrians and Greeks and French people, it looks like a, a continuous distribution of variation, essentially. And so that, what does that tell you? It tells you that like Syria and these Middle Eastern populations, these are Caucasoid people, just like Europeans. Uh, there's a lot of admixture involved, but and that's where the first civilizations were. So they had the nice environment, and then they're also receiving lots of genes from northern tribes and stuff like that which might raise their IQ and then lead to civil the the combination of those things could lead to civilization first emerging you know in Babylon and not Africa and not the really harsh environment where the intelligence selection is coming from of like the European steppe so overall cold winters theory is definitely compelling it explains probably 60 percent of the variance when it comes to national IQ so it's a big part of the overall explanation but it's not the whole explanation and more work needs to be done to derive the whole explanation but it would be silly to just reject cold winters theory as a partial explanation